It's Thursday, January 27. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. The third supplementary estimates of expenditure were reviewed on Wednesday by the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee, PAAC, without debate. The estimates were tabled in Parliament on Tuesday by Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark. More details from Simone Absalom Gale. Financial Secretary Darlene Morrison explains the reasoning behind the proposed adjustment. The adjustments proposed to the existing approved budget for fiscal year 2021-22 all represent reallocations and do not alter the total budgeted expenditure of $893 billion. She notes that the estimates reflect the changes and composition of ministries, departments and agencies and other public bodies. The third supplementary estimates provides for the closure of Head 21,000, Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change, and transfer of its functions to Head 19,000, Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. This also results in the Forestry Department, which is a department of the former Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change, becoming a department of the Ministry of Economic Growth and the Job Creation. The supplementary estimates also provides for the establishment of offices for the new Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. The acting permanent secretary in the ministry, Wayne Robertson, outlined to the PAAC the progress being made. As we speak, work has begun because we have actually hit the ground running. There is no manual to, to guide you as to how to set up a ministry. Notwithstanding, I have been working assiduously to ensure that the ministry is set up and there are a whole lot of administrative matters that I am dealing with and the team is dealing with as we speak. Just want to also indicate that we have agreed with the Ministry of Justice to share services and this ministry, Mr. Chairman and members, will be exemplary in terms of shared corporate services. So we're looking at sharing HR, internal audit and also accounts. Mr. Robertson explained that he and Minister Marlene Malahu Fort are currently being housed at the office of the Prime Minister. He added that the team, which is to be transferred from the Justice Ministry, is still working from that ministry's office located on Constant Spring Road in Kingston. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. President of the Jamaica Agricultural Society, JAS, Lenworth Fulton, says the decision to remove duties from imported chicken leg quarters is a bad move. On Tuesday, Agriculture Minister Pernell Charles Jr. announced in Parliament that the move is being considered to ease the burden on consumers amid rising prices for poultry products. In order to provide Jamaican consumers with an affordable alternative source of protein, one of the options being considered is the temporary suspension of the import and additional stamp duties levied on leg quarters. Currently, the price of leg quarters within the local market is at $360 per pound, Minister Tufton, while we would be able to import leg quarters at $100 per pound and have consumers paying roughly $160 per pound. This would allow Jamaican consumers to purchase at least three times the quantity of poultry meat that they are currently able to afford. However, in a statement, the JAS head says over 150,000 Jamaicans who invested in the poultry industry at the start of the pandemic will see their markets eliminated if this is implemented. He says, quote, they took their remittances, partner payouts, severance pay, small business and family loans and other income and invested in the construction of chicken houses and the production of poultry. And while the larger poultry companies may withstand the impact of this drastic measure or small farmers who are currently producing chicken for sale at $240 to $290 per pound clearly will not, end quote. Mr. Fulton is calling on the Agriculture Minister to consult with the relative stakeholders to better understand the consequences of the decision. The Jamaica Broilers Group has announced a 10% increase in chicken come the end of January. 
Prime Minister Andrew Holness is urging banks to be mindful of the significant financial difficulties being faced by Jamaicans. This follows the announcement by the National Commercial Bank, NCB, and Scotiabank that they will hike fees. Mr. Holness addressed the matter while speaking at the Jamaica Stock Exchange's 17th Regional Investments and Capital Markets Conference on Wednesday. Simone Absalom Gale tells us more. The Prime Minister cautioned financial institutions against being indifferent of the difficulties that Jamaicans face, especially since the pandemic. Persons whose income disappeared or was significantly reduced still have mortgages piling up on them, still have credit card bills that they didn't or were not able to pay. Children are now going back to school, so fees are now coming back in. Bus fares and lunch money have to be paid. And then they have to now hear about increases in bank fees. I repeat, this great potential economy that we have exists in a social context. And the leaders of the economy must pay close attention. Among the new fees, the National Commercial Bank says customers will pay $30.95 to withdraw cash from their ATMs. The service had previously been free. Withdrawals at multi-link ATMs will cost customers $60. NCB is also charging $500 for international withdrawals using its Visa debit card. Effective February 1, Scotiabank's customers will have to pay $25 to withdraw cash from its ATMs and $60 at multi-link ATMs. Mr. Holness also spoke of the pace at which the banking sector is changing access to its services. There needs to be greater engagement of the banking sector with its traditional customers. Yes, there is great take-up, particularly of young people who are technology natives. But our older persons, our elderly, they need banking services too, and they may not readily absorb and adapt. He notes the need to be inclusive when planning changes to digital platforms. The financial inclusion uh, is not only getting persons into the banking system with a bank account, but we also have to ensure that those who are already there know how to use the technology and that the technology is easy for them to use. The Prime Minister's words of caution comes after public outcry regarding the hike in cost to do business at banks. It makes good business sense to protect the people of the country. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang is promising a respectful resolution to the government's current overtime discussion with the Jamaica Police Federation. The police are demanding the payment of overtime money due to them since 2008. I won't speak on the issue with the police force. Its federation is in court. But what I will say is that the government intends to, and it is demonstrated, will for the first time, when the Minister of Finance speak, treat the police force in the professional manner they should be treated. Dr. Chang said the existing impasse came about owing to the failure of successive administrations to afford cops the proper respect. The dispute has emerged because successive governments have treated the police force with almost a level of disrespect in how they treated their salary, giving small bits and pieces of remuneration for some hours here, for some allowance there, and different sections of the police force. The police force will be treated as a professional body, paid as a professional body, and paid for the work they do. That's the commitment of this government that it will be done, and done in this year. 
People of Indian origin or extract account for over 3% of Jamaica's population. Both countries have enjoyed diplomatic relations for decades and are part of the Commonwealth of Nations. The island's top diplomat, Minister and Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith, was a guest of the Indian High Commission at Wednesday's 73rd Republic Day reception. 72 years ago, on January 26, 1950, India adopted the constitution and became a republic. We get more in this report from Carol Francis. The reception commemorating India's 73rd Republic Day was hosted at India House in Kingston. It was attended by select members of the government and the Indian community. In his remarks, India's High Commissioner to Jamaica said the island has provided a platform for the success of many persons of Indian descent. Let me also reiterate our appreciation to the government and the people of Jamaica for accepting and accommodating Indian community and making them proud sons and daughters of the soil. The Jamaican society and political system have demonstrated magnanimity and confidence in opening up opportunities to Indian community here in Jamaica. Because of this enabling and home-like environment, merits of many have been given opportunity to rise and contribute to the nation. There are judges, professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants who are flourishing in Jamaica. The credit goes to the government and the people of Jamaica for heavily investing in such bridge building project of people to people relations. Guest of honor at the reception, Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith underscored the strong relations between both nations. She highlighted a range of errors, including the current pandemic and the aid extended to Jamaica by India. I know it bears repeating, although we have heard it, but it does bear repeating that it was in March 2021 that India was the very first country to respond to Jamaica's request for assistance with a donation of 50,000 doses of COVID shield AstraZeneca vaccines. Since the pandemic, India has provided medical equipment and services valued at millions of Jamaican dollars, in addition to assistance in Jamaica's fight against NCDs. The High Commission of India, as you've seen, has also hosted several free medical camps across the island, and they continue so to do, having continued through December, January, and there are plans for next month, I understand. Diplomatic ties between both countries were strengthened recently, with the appointment of Jamaica's first resident High Commissioner in New Delhi. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Carol Francis. Motorists will have to dip deeper in their pockets for gas and diesel this week. We find out the increases plus delve into market details and news in this extended business report. According to the latest ex-refinery costs from PetroJam, motorists will pay more at the pumps for gasoline and diesel, effective Thursday, January 27. 87 octane gasoline is up by $2.54 and will be sold for $171.72 per litre. 90 octane gasoline saw a $2.10 price increase and will be sold for $176.74 per litre. Automotive diesel fuel saw a price hike of $3.10 and will be sold for $171.60. Ultra-low sulfur diesel is up by $3.01 and will be sold for $177.55 per litre. Meanwhile, kerosene increased by $3.01 and will be sold for $147.93 per litre. Propane liquid petroleum will be sold for $73.13 per litre, up by 16 cents. And butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $83.33 per litre after a 25 cent price drop. Be on the lookout for price changes as marketing companies and retailers will add their markup to these prices. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, January 26, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $157.44. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $130.06. 
The pound sterling traded for two hundred and twelve dollars five cents, and the euro sold for an average one hundred and eighty dollars twenty three cents. In Wednesday's trading session, the following reflect the movement of the JSE indices. The JSE index declined by 2,739 points to close at under 400,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 23 points to close at over 3,000 units. The combined market index declined by 2,299 points to close at over 400,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 3,169 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 107 stocks of which 43 advanced, 48 declined, and 16 traded firm. Stocks advanced for Access Financial Services Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Blue Par Group Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, 1834 Investments Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Trading firm were CAC 2000 9.5% Preference Shares, Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited, and Epley Limited 5% Preference Shares. Wigdon Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with over 15.9 million units followed by Spurtree Spices Jamaica Limited with over 2.2 million units and Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares with over 1.9 million units. In market data for oil, the commodity traded at a seven-year high of about $90 a barrel on Thursday as the Ukraine crisis supported prices despite signs that the U.S. Federal Reserve will tighten monetary policy. Brent crude futures were up six cents or 0.1 percent at ninety dollars two cents a barrel. West Texas intermediate crude futures were down two cents at eighty seven dollars thirty three cents a barrel. The Tax Administration Jamaica TAJ is reminding the public that it will open select tax offices this Saturday, November twenty seven, and every last Saturday of the month for the remainder of the twenty twenty one twenty twenty two financial year. The tax authority says this is subject to any announcements by the government on COVID containment measures. The following tax offices will operate this Saturday between the hours of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. St. Andrew, Montego Bay, Mandeville, Savannah Lamar, St. Anne's Bay and Old Harbor. The Portmore tax office will continue its usual weekly Saturday operations with adjusted business hours of 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. TAJ says the Saturday service alleviates the usually high walk-in traffic at tax offices during the busy month and weekday period. Taxpayers will be able to access taxpayer service activities, including processing motor vehicle registration and other motor vehicle transactions, applying for a taxpayer registration number TRN, dropping off documents for the renewal of their driver's license, and make tax and fee payments. Additionally, motorists who have not as yet collected their printed driver's license cards are able to do so at any of the listed locations if their applications were dropped off there. Audit and compliance activities will not be available during these Saturday operations. Persons are reminded that they may opt to avoid a tax office visit entirely by conducting several transactions online to include payment for driver's license renewal, fitness certificate, traffic ticket, business-related taxes and deductions, and property tax, as well as electronically querying property tax liabilities. For more information, call the Tax Administration Customer Care Center at 888-TAX-HELP. That's 888-829-4357, or visit the website at www.jamaicatax.gov.jm. We turn our attention to news from across the region. Having passed legislation to have Grenada removed from the European blacklist as a tax haven, the law came into effect within the month of January 2022. This means that companies registered internationally had to cross over to become locally registered corporate companies. Finance Minister Gregory Bowen was quizzed on the process of transition during Tuesday's post-cabinet briefing. More details from GBN News. 
No special treatment was given to international companies that had to register locally, says Finance Minister Gregory Bowen, who notes whatever was given is already enshrined in law. Minister Bowen admits that some of these companies were call centres that employ more than 500 people. These call centres earn their revenues from way abroad, Europe, the US. And so the requirement for paying the taxes in Greece is much different to a company that lives and operates here. So when you look at what has happened, maybe there's something that we should have done already. So if you ask us what concessions we, we gave them, what they got was already enshrined in law. The International Business Companies Act was among some of the legislations repealed as Grenada sought to avoid being backlisted for what the European Union described as harmful tax practices. This means that these companies will now pay corporate tax whenever necessary. It means that we have to monitor mainly to see that are they making any income from Grenada? That is what you'll be taxed at the same percentage as any other local company. So it will mean increased surveillance by the Inland Revenue Department. But in general, and there were companies here operating in that manner already. They did not only income here, so I'm not paying tax here. You have the double taxation treaty. That's some people that say, some of them, even if they own it here, because of this, they pay tax only in the, in the country of origin. The finance minister says the local legislation was already available to ensure the companies affected remain and pay the taxes due. Now remember, we do not have any IBC on our books. That must go. As you rightly indicated, the most, so the IBC law is no longer in place. What they are following is our local law with which the double taxation treaty kicks in. And so they recognize now instead of dealing with us and not dealing with anybody, they will have to deal with the parent um, company and countries of residence where they, where they were incorporated and they deal with us in Grenada. So we are following the law. The Inland Revenue Department will be taxing them on revenues owned in Grenada. I am Gerard Joseph for GBN News. And in Barbados, consumers are being told not to expect any ease in prices, at least in the foreseeable future, as importers continue to battle with global supply chain disruptions. More details from Barbados today. The caution came as Central Bank Governor Cleveston Haynes reported that while it was possible for the government to provide an ease in some taxes, it would have to weigh it carefully against possible impact and also search for other revenue streams. He made the comments on Wednesday as he delivered his Barbados Economic Review for 2021. From our perspective right now, what we see is that prices will remain elevated. You know, first, as, as always, uh, some prices will go up and some will come down, but I think on average prices will remain uh, elevated. Uh, we indicated that the, the moving average ratio was about 3.2%, I think, at the end, towards the end of 2021. And based on what we've seen with how prices moved in the last half of 2021, there's likely to see that, that moving average inflation rate going up and possibly even the point-to-point the, the -point rate going up in, in the short term. In Trinidad and Tobago, the president of one highway action committee in the country, Edward Moody, is demanding answers after a section of road collapsed early January. Mr. Moody has also alleged that the road work is causing environmental challenges. Strong words from the president of the Day Bay to Point Fourteen Highway Action Committee, Edward Moody, regarding the planning for the South Trunk Road, which collapsed in the Mosquito Creek area on January 2nd is a direct result of failure of the authorities to actually deal with the testing that was done by Trinto Plan and AECOM. They have failed to pile this section of the highway and in my opinion the entire length of this two kilometers should have been piled. He says that the foundation for the wall keeping out the sea is weak. Mr. Moody is also questioning the CEC, which was done originally. He says it has caused an environmental nightmare. The land here is continuing to be pulled into the sea. And if we look out in the sea, you will see where the seabed is now above the water level. This happened because the gravel that was compacted here 
because of the vibration, it has softened the marshland underneath with the silt and marsh underneath and has pushed everything outwards towards the area of least resistance. Mr. Moody says that the fish that normally go into the mangrove to spawn have been unable to do so for some time now, and this has negatively affected fishing. He's begging the authorities to make the needed changes. Two years now we have been saying that a two-kilometer stretch of highway, there is no drainage of this entire mangrove. And what this is doing, the water is backing up and flooding out woodland, Pinal, Debe, because the natural sheet flow of the water has been stopped because this road has been elevated. The water cannot get into the sea. Works and Transport Minister Rohan Sinanen said in Parliament on Tuesday the South Trunk Road poses no threat to commuters despite the road collapse on January 2nd. And in lighter news, we go back to Trinidad and Tobago, where beach hours will soon be extended. From Monday, January 31, 2022, beaches in Trinidad and Tobago will now be open from 5 a.m. to 6 p.m. The extension announcement was made by the country's health minister. This decision was made after discussions between Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley and the Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, Farley Augustine. Previously, beaches were opened from 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. During today's COVID-19 update, Minister of Health Terence Dial Singh said he was given authorization to make the announcement by the Prime Minister. This will also extend to reef tours, swamp tours, and other like activities, but with a 50% capacity and we urge no partying, no alcohol, and so on. And we urge caution after the beaches close at 6 p.m. to please no after beach line um, partying, especially with your masks off, and so on. In sports, we look to cricket. Rovman Powell struck a ton which propelled the West Indies to a 20-run win over England in the third 2020 international at Bridgetown Barbados on Wednesday. This brings a five-match series to 2-1. They recalled Powell's 107 of just 53 balls as well as his fourth wicket stand of 122 with Nicholas Peran helped take the West Indies to an imposing 224 for five. The series continues when the teams return to the Kensington Oval on Saturday. And with that, we bring an end to another newscast. Join us tomorrow right here for more news and sports right here on PBCJ, the People's Station.